Hello everybody, I'm Howie Hawkins, the Green Party candidate for governor, and today we're going to talk about worker co-ops, and I have with me Frank Sotera, who's the Green Party candidate for counselor at large in the Syracuse, and his real job or day job is uh, working for the Small Business Administration, and he's an expert on co-ops. So what we're talking about today really gets at the core problem of capitalism, wage labor where you go to work and you produce value, but you only get about half of it, and the other half goes to the owners. And that's called exploitation. When we talk about ownership, there are two main rights that the owners have. One is to the net income or profit at the end of the accounting period. And when the owners take it, and the workers don't get the full value of what they produced, it's called exploitation. The thing about a worker co-op is each worker gets paid in proportion to their labor contribution. So every worker gets the full fruit of their labor or the full value of what they produced after the co-op has paid for the cost of doing business. You know, it's paying for the rent, the utilities, the cost of goods sold, and so forth. The other thing ownership gives you is the right to manage. And in the traditional capitalist firm, it's a dictatorship. You lose your bill of rights when you cross the threshold of the workplace and your work is directed. You don't have the right to say anything you want. You don't have your freedom of speech. You don't have freedom of association. If you got a union, it's restricted to time off work in, in non-work areas. So in a co-op, you collectively manage what you're doing, the work you're doing democratically. And I was fortunate to have an experience working in a worker co-op 1978 to 1982, I was working in construction and a group of us who were involved in the anti-nuclear movement decided we were going to do solar and wind installations and energy efficiency audits and insulating homes. Uh, and we developed a business plan and we went to work. Now, there was no worker co-op law in New Hampshire where we were, but we took a partnership and built internally a co-op set of rules and ran it like a co-op. And we were successful. We were doing what they call today green jobs before we even knew what green jobs were. And it was, it was a great place to work. My experience, and I worked in construction for over 20 years, is that when you work for another contractor, you get exploited. You don't, you don't get the full value of what you've produced. Uh, and when you're your own contractor, you're working day and night. You're supervising the crew on a job site during the day. At night, you're hustling up the next job doing estimates, bids, you're doing the payroll. Back then we didn't have computers, you didn't have QuickBooks, you did it on graph paper. I mean, I didn't know, how, I hardly slept. So it was overworking me. I made better money, but it was a lot of work. In the co-op, I got the full value of what I created in the course of work, and the management tasks were shared among us. So it was a great way to work. And when we had a problem, we got together and worked on it. Uh, it's unlike, and I've been in a lot of jobs since, where actually the workers know more than the boss or the foreman or the supervisor how to really do the job. But when you're working for somebody else, you got to do what they say, even if it's stupid. So working in a co-op is a great thing. And uh, the only thing I'll add, and then I'll let uh, Frank talk about the co-op movement and what's going on right now, is that we were a six-person uh, worker co-op. So we just met, we were like the board of directors ourselves. We met in an assembly when we had to work out issues or make plans. In a larger co-op, you know, 20, 30, 100, 1,000 people, uh, you need to elect a board of directors, which then hires the management. And you can have unions, which can deal with grievances because, you know, managers and workers have different roles and there can be grievances come up and they can collectively bargain. Uh, the difference being that the workers have a vested interest in the co-op doing well. And one of the things we find uh, where th there are worker co-ops and compare them to traditional capitalist firms, they're much more productive and efficient because every worker knows the better they do the job, the more money they're going to make. Whereas in a capitalist firm, if you can do enough to get by without getting fired, you're going to get the same wage whether you knock yourself out or just get by. So these worker co-ops tend to be more productive. And uh, one more interesting thing about co-ops is that they don't grow uh, endlessly because it's, 
when you when you reach the economic threshold of uh, scale of economy, you're ma you're maximizing the income per worker, and it doesn't make any sense to get any bigger. Nobody benefits. Whereas in a capitalist firm, you're getting profit from every worker you're exploiting, and even if you reach your economy of scale, the more you can uh, hire people to exploit and sell your product, you're going to keep on growing. So one thing about worker co-ops is they are more amenable to an economy that is sustainable and meeting people's needs without growing like a cancer that destroys the environment. So those are some thoughts to keep in mind about co-ops. Frank has a lot of hands-on experience uh, working on co-ops and the co-op movement in New York State, so why don't you tell people about that? Absolutely. Thanks for uh, sharing the microphone with me tonight. I love talking about co-ops, and so I'm excited to be here. One other thing I want to mention in regards to what you were saying about the characteristics of worker co-op is in relation to the jobs themselves and how most of the time, whenever you hear politicians or policymakers or uh, elected officials talk about jobs, they talk about it in terms of it being a commodity, essentially, and not talking about it in terms of the people that it's actually affecting. Whereas if you're a worker cooperative and you own those jobs, uh, those jobs are no longer just commodities to be bought and traded and sold uh, by some uh, business owner that doesn't necessarily have the interests of those workers in mind. And so that's an important thing uh, to consider as well because worker-owned co-ops um, are uh, a part of a community more so than any other type of business, even you know the um, often used phrase of a family-owned business that gets lots of kudos. Uh, families still, uh, family-owned businesses have still up and left communities where they have been a long time uh, stalwarts and that doesn't necessarily happen in a worker co-op because the workers make those decisions and are able to um, hold those jobs in place. And one big uh, item of news that recently uh, has presented itself is the passage of the Main Street Employment Ownership Act, uh, headed up by Senator Gillibrand, and that was passed last week into law. And the great thing about this is now it's going to open up a lot of technical assistance and access to uh, loan guarantees from the SBA for worker cooperatives and, and cooperative owned businesses. This is really important in terms of that uh, framework of community and neighborhoods and cities and municipalities who rely on businesses as, uh, as, as anchors and foundations um, for the well-being of the residents of those communities. And so that Main Street Employment uh, Ownership Act was precipitated to a large degree by the current state of the baby boomer gener generation that's reaching retirement age. And the baby boomer generation speaks for itself, being a large uh, cohort of population. And as a result, that also translates into being the largest cohort of business ownership at this point in time. So you can imagine the volume of money that uh, these business owners control right now, the volume of assets. And so what happens when they reach retirement age? Well, you have the traditional options of perhaps passing that business down to somebody else in the family, but we see that happening more, uh, less and less these days in society. Uh, you have the option of maybe selling to a competitor or liquidating the business. In those options, the jobs that are a part of that business are not guaranteed to be maintained. And that's the, the scary part for many employees of small business owners. So why not, uh, as Howie mentioned, those folks who are working those trades or working those businesses often know that business better than anybody else, uh, better than the managers and better than the owners themselves in some cases. And so why not sell it to uh, a willing population of people, the workers themselves, who already know the business and who have a vested interest in wanting to see those jobs maintained in that city. I think that's uh, one of the exciting parts of this for the working class community that we have. So my role with the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, as a New York State uh, business advisor is providing that technical assistance uh, that's required through our um, funder, the SBA. And so now we'll have the opportunity to really focus some of our efforts and some of our resources on educating 
and providing business planning assistance and, and business development assistance uh, specifically for co-ops. So this could mean a big boost in the amount of interest and in the amount of implementation for worker co-ops that, that we might see in, in the upcoming years. We have seen that there are certain cities uh, and certain areas that have taken the lead already and made this implementation of, of a worker co-op movement uh, part of operations without waiting for uh, without waiting for something such as the Main Street Employee Ownership Act. The New York City uh, Council a few years ago allocated a couple million dollars. Uh, to organizations in the city of New York to provide technical assistance. And since that time, they've seen a number of worker co-ops in the city of Syracuse rise from, I believe the number was... Some, city of New York City. The city of New York City. <laughs> I wish I could say this about the city of Syracuse, yeah. and someday we will. But the number of worker co-ops in New York City that's risen over the past couple years from somewhere around five to somewhere around 80 currently. Um, that information I just got when I was attending the New York City Network of Worker Co-ops conference this summer down in the city. And those entities that are getting the money are doing the kinds of technical assistance that the SBDC and other folks will be doing, working with the local residents of the community, working with the local workers and um, folks who need that technical assistance and are able to get it for free in most cases to be able to... Um, um, make sure that they're putting the, this, this worker co-op together correctly. This was uh, also in the news uh, in, in recent years in the city of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, that had a, um, a project where they created three different worker co-ops in the city in partnership with uh, contracts related to different uh, foundational anchor institutions uh, such as universities and hospitals. And so this was sort of a top-down and a bottom-up approach to identifying uh, needs uh, in the community that could be fulfilled by uh, working uh, uh, different types of business entities, one being a laundry as an example. And so if you've got a uh, ready hospital or, or other um, medical institution that needs laundry done, uh, linens done on a regular basis, and you can create an entity that can provide that service while at the same time creating a, a worker-owned co-op where those workers are able to achieve levels of equity and assets and control of the business, then you've got a win-win situation. It's interesting you brought up, uh, you, you had the Freudian slip of Syracuse <laughs> when you're talking about New York City. We have raised this as Greens as something the city could do. And it was Greens in Rochester that ran on it, and then lovely Warren, the mayor, picked it up and put it in their economic development office, and they're doing a little project just like uh, New York City is, except it's more like Cleveland because they're partnered with the uh, Democracy Collaborative, which helped the Cleveland. There are three worker co-ops out there, and they have a funding and uh, technical assistance relationship with the big nonprofits, the Eds and Meds, around uh, Cleveland Circle, that's Case Western University and the Cleveland Clinic. And we've always said in Syracuse, between Syracuse University and the hospitals up on the hill here, and we have a laundromat, an industrial laundry, that's one of the things they did in Cleveland. We've got one shut down right here on the south side, just across the interstate that divides the university community from mainly black, uh, low-income, working-class community on this side. And the uh, city hasn't picked it up. Um, the thing is, one or two million dollars in New York City doesn't go very far. I mean, if you've been in business, you know that's a small business. And if we're talking about scaling this up, what I've been talking about in my campaign for governor is we need a state bank where the state deposits money, and that's the reserves for lending out to do infrastructure, going around Wall Street, cutting out that middleman, cutting the financing charges in half for infrastructure projects and business development. But I would like to see it do what the Mondragon Cooperative Network did in Spain. This is probably the most successful network of industrial cooperatives, over 100 of them. Uh, their revenues are in the billions, their employees are in the tens of thousands. And then on the consumer side, they have like 300,000 members. The Mondragon is in the Basque region of Spain, an oppressed nationality that under Franco the fascist couldn't do politics, so they did this economic experiment. And what was very successful for it was 
that they had uh, what it originally called the Bank of People's Labor. And in, Mon in Spanish and uh, the Basque language, it's got it's another, other words, but basically called the Bank of People's Labor. And that bank would do the business plan. They'd look at the markets, find an opportunity. They, they got involved in appliance manufacturing, stoves and refrigerators and washing machines, and, you know, a tough competitive business, and they were very successful. And it seems to me the key to their success was they had very good business planning. Then they would hire the workers, train them in cooperative management as well as the uh, skills they needed for the job, hire the management, and then the co-op would manage itself. And over the decades, this started in the 50s and, and, and still going on today, a huge uh, industrial enterprise with these 100 industrial co-ops and a bunch of auxiliary institutions, um, they were able, because they were so successful, they actually took that planning function out of the co-op, the credit union, the Bank of People's Labor, and endowed it. So they now have a university, a nonprofit institution that does this and trains the managers, trains workers, uh, and does the business planning. They provide technical assistance to get them up. And the success rate, basically 98% of their startups succeeded compared to something like 20 or 30% of small business or startup businesses still being around five years later in this country. So this is a successful model of, of business development. And we could do it on a much larger, larger scale with the billions of dollars that New York has on deposit in these Wall Street banks that, you know, are exploiting us. Uh, so uh, uh, there have been pilgrimages to Mondragon by people in, in this country. Uh, one was done by Gail McLaughlin when she was the green mayor of Richmond, and they now have a co-op project in partnership with Mondragon. And the United Steel Workers did it with the idea of union co-ops, and uh, they're working with Mondragon on that project. So I think we need to bring that into New York State and have that entrepreneurial co-op development division within the state bank. And they would do business planning, help finance, and start up these businesses and set them on their way. And I think it could be a very successful model. So that's, yeah, it's, you know, go it's ahead. Re really important to, to talk about the, the state bank because even with the technical assistance that can be provided to the entrepreneurs for forming the worker co-ops, they still have to identify funding and, and the financing and the lenders who are willing to uh, make those transactions with them. So having an institution that has that uh, uh, baked into them uh, is something that would be important as a channel for finding that financing. Yeah, and one of the things you know as I think the former chair of the board of the Syracuse Cooperative Development Credit Union, which is current, a current chair. Current chair, current chair. okay. <laughs> Busy man. Um, you know that the banks have lobbied the state to limit the amount of business lending that credit unions can do. And uh, you know what the limits are. I, I don't know them off the top of my head. But that's another reason to have a state bank that could provide this financing. Although, of course, we should uh, not let the banks be in charge of business lending. Because in my experience, and, and you know, I've been around Syracuse, talked to a lot of small business owners. When they go to a bank like Chase or Citibank, which is not a local bank, the bank has a cookie cutter template and they put it on your business plan and it, they don't take account of, you know, how reliable are you? How hard a worker are you? What kind of relationships do you have on a community that, say if you're starting a restaurant or a retail outlet, that you already have a customer base because people know you and like you. Those kinds of things are totally missing when these giant banks come in with their templates, which are just an algorithm or a formula uh, to apply to a situation they don't really understand. We have the same thing with mortgage lending here. Here I mentioned the South Side. The commercial banks on Wall Street just don't lend here, or they lend once you know, in a while just to get the uh, Community Reinvestment Act off their back. Whereas the credit union, which can do more home loan mortgage loaning, lending, and the one community bank we have here, Solve Bank, uh, you know, do lend in this community because they, they know who they can, uh, you know, make a lend to, a, a loan to that is, uh, you know, a reasonable risk given who the person is. So that's another reason to uh, loosen up what we do with the credit unions in terms of who they can lend to. Yeah, we refer to that as character-based lending. And, you know, here in, in Syracuse, Cooperative Federal just received some 
of the state funds that were uh, released as a part of the Alliance for Economic Inclusion so that we can do more business lending uh, based upon character and making sure that we are asking all the questions beyond just the uh, numbers that are included on the business plan. Uh, it's important that uh, folks realize that there are lots of uh, things that happens in people's lives and that uh, those can be turned around. So, uh, you know, financing a startup is another issue versus financing a pre-existing business. And there are also a lot of lenders that won't finance startups. Um, but if you have this integrated system of, of technical assistance and, and, and financing available, then it's uh, more likely potential to, to work on more startup development. And I think the co-ops can help low-wage workers in a lot of fields. Uh, we have a good example uh, in the South Bronx. There's a home health aid cooperative that's been around for a couple decades. It's not a giant in the market down there, but it does well. It pays better than the other agencies because that co-op is oriented in maximizing the income for the home health aides, not profit for investors, and they have better benefits. Um, another area where I think we really need a lot of uh, work in co-ops is we should just replace these temp agencies that, you know, they send people out where the, the company that's hiring the temps is maybe paying $20 an hour, but the workers receiving $10 an hour because the temp agency is taking the rest. They need some for overhead, but the rest is for profit. One of the most exploitive businesses we've got, and it's, it's growing because a lot of companies now just want a contingent labor force rather than a permanent labor force. And I think that's an area where if we had a state bank with a uh, co-op development division, that would be a field where they could get right in there and raise a lot of people's wages who are doing that temporary work. Yeah, absolutely. And even uh, with uh, the conversions that we talked about previously, you know, if you're converting a business uh, from a sole, uh, sole owner to the workers there, um, they'll likely see their wages go up as well uh, over time. And I think that... Um, um, being able to uh, creatively finance uh, is, is a really important thing too. Just you made me think of an, another example in New York City where uh, a conversion was was facilitated in which 75% of the financing for this conversion came from uh, contracts that were guaranteed a couple years out from the customers of this business. And that was matched with uh, some other more traditional financing. So one of the things that... Uh People, co-ops took a while to figure out how to do worker co-ops where the workers are the owners. It was one of the first things that working people who are coming off the farms or out of trades where they were artisans and getting into factory situations and realizing they were being exploited. They called it wages slavery. And uh, what they first thought of is we, we should own this collectively as a cooperative. So cooperatives were developed early on when workers began rebelling against regimentation in these uh, capitalist enterprises. But the problem they found was when the worker co-ops were successful, the value of the assets, you know, each worker owned a share. In a worker co-op, it's one person, one vote. And no matter how much equity you have in the co-op, you only get one vote. But then when it's time to retire or move on, you want your equity back. And what they kept finding was they had a succession problem. A famous example was a bunch of Finnish immigrants set up plywood worker cooperatives, I believe in the 30s. And uh, when they got ready to retire in the 50s and 60s, all of them were getting to retirement age at the same time. And so they were just decapitalizing the co-op. And the only way they could get their equity back so they could retire with some money was to sell the warehouser. So they weren't able to succeed. So the invention that was developed uh, really in the 60s and 70s in this country was you have internal capital accounts that represent your share. So at the end of the year, you take the extra income, the net income or the profit, some you take home with you, some you reinvest in the business, and some you put in your capital account. So the, the co-op has working capital. And then when you leave, you don't get it all at once. You get it over, say, a five-year period. So the payout gives the co-op a chance to absorb new workers who put in their equity share as they're working. And usually a worker has to put in, you know, a certain amount as an initial payment. They don't have to have that money in their pocket. They can pay it in installments, just like if you're coming into a union job, you pay your initiation fee 
out of your paycheck in installments. So that's one thing that uh, worker co-ops now have that allows them to uh, continue through generations of workers. Yeah, and it's about good planning and uh, having the system set up so that you can facilitate it in that way. Um, and like you said, we've learned over time how to do that, and so now we've got a uh, good strategy going forward. So Greg asks, uh, what role can unions play in supporting worker-owned co-ops, in particular providing access to collective, collective bargaining agreements, health care consortia, and a secure retirement for workers? How can co-ops benefit from strong union agreements and avoid falling into a freelance gig economy? So you want to start with that? Or you want me to go ahead? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, as I mentioned, you need a union, and especially in a large co-op, so you can handle grievances with the people who have the supervisory roles as opposed to the line worker roles. And uh, when it comes time to decide how you're going to divide up uh, what the pays are, pay is for the different working, workers and different jobs, um, you know, the workers can get together and bargain with the managers. I, I should add at this point that generally in worker co-ops, the, the ratio of management to worker income is radically reduced compared to capitalist firms. In Mondragon, they started out at three to one. And as in the recent decades, as they got into some very complicated businesses uh, to get the management people, they've got as high as six or seven to one. Um, that is nothing like what we have in this country. I mean, back in the Eisenhower era, it was about 25 to one on average. Today, it's three or 100 to 400 to one. Um, I was just reading because we're talking about there's a proposal to uh, turn uh, Spectrum into a consumer cooperative down in New York City. And I was reading their business plan today and uh, they pointed out that the uh, CEO of Charter, which owns Spectrum, had a pay package of ninety eight million dollars in 2016. I mean, the guy may be good, but he's not that much. I doubt he could do the technical work that, you know, the people coming out to your home to fix your cable know how to do. So um, that's how crazy it is. So in a co-op, it's much more equitable. Um, so in terms of healthcare consortia, I guess you're talking about health plans, and that's something that would be collectively decided. Um, the workers organizing their union, working with the management, would have a real voice in, in deciding on the plan. And the same with pension benefits, so there's a secure retirement. Um, the Mondragon Network uh, because the state of Spain did not provide those things like uh, a national health insurance plan, like uh, now now Spain is closer to that, but at the time in the 50s they did not, and as most industrial countries do, and the United States does not, they have their own internal pension and health care plans that are uh, operated by the whole co-op network. Um, but in a particular co-op, you would get a, a health care plan and a retirement plan, a pension plan. So the union definitely uh, gives the workers an organized voice in a way to, uh, um, you know, figure out how to deal with management. Who is dealing with those kinds of issues, the paperwork on a regular basis, whereas the workers are, you know, doing what they do every day. Yeah, th that's important to realize that there's still a hierarchy of management within a worker co-op like many other businesses. And we've seen that some of the, uh, I was talking with, a worker conversion uh, member owner just last week in terms of shifting ownership from a single owner to a group of six. This is a landscape uh, worker co-op in the Hudson Valley. And she was concerned because they've gone through this issue of confusion related to hierarchy versus non-hierarchy and that a co-op is not necessarily everybody is on equal footing and everybody can make all the decisions at any time for everybody else and so you do have a hierarchy so it is important for representation and union structure to be included in that. So how do co-ops relate to socialism as a goal for our society or how do worker co-ops and I think they get at the most important, unique feature of capitalism, which is the wage-labor relationship, the relationship between, between the employer and the employee, because that's where exploitation happens. That's where the worker is a hired hand who is, works as directed, has no freedom, uh, has no democratic say in how they do their job. And they're a commodity. As, as uh, Frank was saying, the thing worker co-ops do is decommodify labor. You, you're self-employed or collectively self-employed, 
not a hired hand who can be hired and fired at will by an employer. Um, you know, a lot of people think socialism is government ownership. Well, you can have government ownership and have wage labor and exploitation. Uh, the former Soviet Union showed that. Uh, the New York Power Authority shows that. There's lots of examples of where the government owns something, but the workers are just exploited workers and have no say and uh, don't get the full value of what they produce. And a lot of people say, well, socialism is planning and capitalism is markets. That's nonsense. There were markets before capitalism, there were markets after. The question for a social society is what things do you distribute by the market? People earn money, they go out and buy what they need, and what things do you decommodify and provide as a public good, like schools, like roads? We say healthcare. Uh, a lot of the housing so that the housing market is affordable. Uh, there are a lot of things, banking, uh, some things we should have a mix of public and private ownership. Uh, you, can have a, you can keep private banks with a public bank, but that sets a yardstick to which the private banks have to, uh, with which the private banks have to compete. But I think worker co-ops get right at the core. Now, the idea that we can uh, displace the capitalists by organizing worker co-ops is probably a pipe dream. Um, at some point, we have to take on these giant corporations and the super rich and take their power from them and distribute it de democratically through an economy that's organized democratically as well as a political system that's more democratic. And, uh, but worker co-ops can play an important role. And socialists have recognized that from a long time, like I, for a long time. Like I mentioned, one of the first things the working class decided to do when they, they didn't like the factory system was talk about cooperative production. And Marx says a lot of positive things about co-ops. It's not the whole solution, but uh, particularly in uh, volume three of Capital and a whole lot of other writings, he uh, admired them, although they weren't the solution all by themselves or the total solution. So you want to add anything to that? Uh, well, I just think that I agree with what you say in regards to socialism and that it comes down to, you know, the common good, essentially, and creating an opportunity for everyone to, to live a life of dignity. And, and uh, a job is a part of that, and the ability to hold on to that job and manage that job is, is important uh, in, in the end. Um, I just want to make one, one other mention. I think we're getting ready to wrap up here is to uh, plug uh, also the Democracy at Work Institute that I've got a working relationship right now. If you want to learn more about the business conversion process, uh, we do have a, a document, a business conversion guide that uh, can help lead you along that process. And then you can reach out to people who can provide further technical assistance for that. But it's very valuable. It's um, something that uh, continuing to work on here in New York State and continuing to spread the word about. Yeah, and I would add uh, the economist Rick Wolf, who's written a lot about uh, worker co-ops, uh, had a recent article on this question of socialism and worker co-ops that was published in the last couple of weeks, maybe last week. And uh, so Google that article, and uh, I think he has a good discussion there that's worth considering. So it's time to wrap up, and uh, I, I thank everybody for watching us. If you want to get involved in our campaigns, uh, my website is howiehawkins.org, and on there you can find our whole platform, uh, all the news about us, our news releases, how to volunteer, how to donate. And Frank is running a campaign here in Syracuse, and there are probably some people who want to support you, so tell them how to get a hold of you. Absolutely. So this is a special election, this general uh, election in November for the at-large city council position, and my website is at www.votesatira.org. Also, I'm on Facebook, Frank Satira one the number, and uh, find my email and my contact uh, phone number as well. And I would love to hear you from you, and uh, if you've got questions, further questions about co-ops, uh, feel free to reach me about those as well. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.